Great. Uh, so thanks, Irene, and uh, and thank you to to you and Miguel for the invitation. Uh, it is it's good to be back here. Uh, as some of you know, I was uh, a PhD student of, of Cumberland's. I uh, finished in 2017, and this is actually the first seminar I've given at Harvard, uh, so to speak. I think since then. So it's good to be back, even if on Zoom. And hopefully, I can uh, come visit again in person. So, uh, so indeed, my talk today is on generalized global symmetries in the weak gravity conjecture, and it's based primarily on three papers of mine uh, with different collaborators that have appeared in uh, the last few months. So uh, let me start off by, by telling you what are the main takeaways of this talk, and then I'll remind you what these are again at the end. So first of all, um, I'm going to introduce, or perhaps review, the notion of higher form symmetries. So these are symmetries whose charged objects have dimension greater than zero. We're going to see that the weak gravity conjecture is closely related to the breaking of these higher form symmetries. We're also going to see uh, that there's a, another notion in quantum field theory called a higher group symmetry. These are symmetries in which two or, or sorry, excuse me, two or more higher form symmetries are mixed up in some sense. There is with emergent higher group symmetries can lead to an, an analogous mixing up of weak gravity conjectures, which is mirrored in supergravity in various dimensions. Uh, much of the Swampland program, we'll see, can be understood in terms of the breaking of these generalized global symmetries. So this, I think, is a testament to the power of these symmetries, not only in understanding quantum field theory, but also in understanding quantum gravity. OK, so first of all, let me introduce or review the notion of a higher form global symmetry. So these symmetries were introduced to the quantum field theory community by Gaiotto, Kapustin, Cyborg, and Willett in 2014. Uh, and since then, they've, they've really taken the QFT world by storm. So the idea here uh, is that we say that we have a, a, a Q form global symmetry when we have some symmetry with charged operators that are Q dimensional. So the case of an ordinary global symmetry that one learns about in a, in a quantum field theory course where you have fields that transform under uh, symmetry transformations correspond to the case of Q equals zero, because here the charged operators are local operators associated with zero dimensional manifolds or points in space time. Global symmetries form a group G, which could be either discrete or continuous. For Q equals zero, uh, it may be either non-abelian or abelian. We're all familiar with non-abelian flavor symmetries, for instance. But for a Q greater than zero, these symmetries are necessarily abelian. And if they're continuous, if the group is, is a continuous group, then under reasonable assumptions, there will be a conserved another current J, which is a D minus Q minus one form. Uh, some of you may be accustomed to, to thinking of this instead as a, as a Q plus one form. Uh, in which case, the J that you're thinking of is simply related to this J by Hodge duality. So if you prefer to, to use that convention, you can just put a star before every J that you see in this talk. But I'm going to use the, the convention that Gaido, Kapustin, Cyborg, and Willett used and refer to this as a D minus Q minus one form. The symmetries are associated and implemented by symmetry generators also known sometimes as charge operators. The symmetry generators are labeled by elements of the group and they live on manifolds of dimension D minus Q minus one for a Q form symmetry. These operators satisfy a fusion law. So you can take two of these operators associated with the same manifold M and fuse them to get a third operator where here G double prime is equal to G times G prime. So the fusion law is, is uh, simply given by this group multiplication law. These operators are topological. And what that means is that if I, if I have some operator which lives on a manifold M, I can deform this manifold M. And as long as I do this in a nice smooth way, and as long as I don't cross over any charged operators in the process, then any correlation function involving this operator is going to be equal to the correlation function with this operator instead. In the case of a U1 global symmetry, which is the case that we'll be primarily interested in in this talk, 
we can be a little bit more explicit about the form of these uh, symmetry generators. Namely, a symmetry generator associated with some manifold M and an element G equals I uh, e to the I alpha is given by the exponentiated integral of the another current over the manifold M. Uh, symmetries in quantum field theory are associated with word identities. And in language of these symmetry generators, what the word identity says is that if you take some charged operator, which again lives on a manifold of dimension Q for a Q-form symmetry, and you surround it by one of these symmetry generators, then you can shrink this symmetry generator. And uh, ultimately, this gives you back just the charged operator that you started with times some representation of the group. So in the case of an abelian symmetry, this here is just going to be some phase, which depends on the element of the group G, as well as the charge of the charged operator. Pictorially, what's happening here, we're taking the symmetry uh, generator and it surrounds a charged operator. And we can then shrink this symmetry generator because it's topological. So we can shrink it without affecting any correlation functions. And if we shrink it all the way to, to a point, then we just pick up this phase. It's uh, helpful to consider an example, which is an example that will play a role for us shortly when we get to a discussion of the weak gravity conjecture. Uh, so this is uh, just ordinary U1 gauge theory. This is pure U1 gauge theory, so there's no charged matter. And uh, here, there's going to be two U1 one-form symmetries, what we'll refer to as an electric one and a magnetic one. The electric one has another current given by star F. The magnetic one has a current given by F up to some constants. And the associated charged operators for the electric one are the Wilson loops, whereas for the magnetic one, they're the Etuf loops. The word identity for, say, the electric one uh, tells us that if we take one of these Wilson loops or Wilson lines, and we surround it by one of these symmetry generators, which is given by the exponentiated integral of the another current, then we can shrink this symmetry generator to a point, and we'll get back just the Wilson line that we started with times this phase, which again depends on the element of the group given by EDI alpha, as well as the charge Q of the Wilson line. Okay, so thus far we've talked about exact global symmetries. Now let's talk a little uh, briefly about approximate symmetries. So appro approximate symmetries are have been much less discussed in the literature, um, in part just because it's they're, they're not quite as uh, clean or or uh, sharply defined. But from what we've said so far, we can at least give a, a rough heuristic definition of an approximate symmetry. When we have an exact symmetry we will have exactly topological charge operators uh, or symmetry generators. As we saw, we can change the size and the shape uh, without affecting any correlation functions. When we have an approximate symmetry, therefore, we expect that the charge operators will be almost topological, that they'll have only slight sensitivity to variations in the manifold M. So as M changes, the correlation functions may change, but, but not by too much. Okay, so uh, to make this more precise, what we can do is to consider a uh, correlation function that involves, that involves the symmetry generator and a charged operator. So essentially what we're doing is we're considering the word identity here. And if the symmetry were exact, so if you had an exact symmetry, then acting on one of these charged operators with a symmetry generator would give us the symmetry generator uh, or sorry, would give us the charged operator times this phase. And this phase would be completely independent of this, uh, the size and shape of this manifold. So here, if, we have, if we're surrounding the charged operator by a symmetry generator that lives on a sphere of radius r, then this phase is going to be independent of r. Uh, 
If the symmetry is not exact, though, if it's only approximate, then we expect that we'll still have these uh, this approximately conserved current J, and therefore that this word identity will still be approximately correct, except that there might be some variation of this phase with R. And so we can quantify this by defining this, this parameter delta, which essentially measures the effective charge. And it's given simply here by the, the logarithmic derivative of this phase omega. And so- Is it clear, Tom, that this does not depend on V? Yeah, so it seems like it's- Oh, good. Thanks, yes. Oh, yes, it, it does. Um, we're going to just use a, uh, a unit for the, we'll be looking at the U1 case. We'll just be looking at charge one uh, operators here. Um, well, actually, I think- Different I, charge one operators have different kind of deltas. Um, I, it's not a priori obvious, right? It, you're right, it's not, it's not a, uh, a priori obvious. I think actually, um, th for the effects that we'll see, actually, because we're taking the logarithmic derivative here, um, <clears throat> any sort, the, the way that, that uh, the charge does show up will actually uh, cancel out from the numerator and the denominator once we take this logarithmic derivative. So, um, so for, for in the cases that we'll see, it actually is going to not matter what, what okay. the charge is. But I, I agree that a priori that that, that wasn't clear. Um, good. So, okay. So, uh, so what we're going to say now is that at a distant scale R naught, uh, the symmetry is exact if delta is equal to zero. So in which case the charge operators are, are topological. We're going to say that it's approximate of delta is much less than one. And we're going to say that it's badly broken or, or strongly broken if delta is order one or larger. So, uh, pictorially, what we're doing here, we're taking the charged operator, we're surrounding it with the symmetry generator, and then we're varying the radius of the symmetry generator, and we're seeing how the uh, correlation functions change as we do this. Uh, may I ask a question? Sure. Are you considering a perturbative situation where you have a theory for which you have exact symmetry and charge operator to it, and then perturbing it? If not, uh, how are you going to define charge operator and approximate symmetry operators? Yeah. So if some, I, I, uh, if you, I'm giving, giving some quantum field theory that I don't know much about, how do I find those operators? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, what you're saying is, is right, is correct. So, so we're working in some quantum field theory uh, where, where we have, I mean, where we essentially have a, a whole one parameter family of quantum field theories. And as we take some parameter to zero, the symmetry becomes exact. And so we're seeing, uh, and so when we turn on this parameter, uh, we are using the same charged operators, the same symmetry generators as we had in the limit where that parameter goes to zero. And so we're seeing how turning on this parameter, how that affects these, these correlations. So, so you are considering the situation where say in the, swamp, in the context of swamp plant program, you have a situation where uh, uh, Planck scale or Newton constants is adjustable compared to scale of quantum field theory. So that you can consider a situation where the breaking can be made parametrically very small. That's right, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thanks. Yep. That's a good question. Yes, we we uh, we ha we have more discussion in our uh, in our paper about about this uh, topic as well. So that's yeah. This this is a good question. Okay. So now let me talk about the uh, how this relates to the weak gravity conjecture. So um, I'm going to start by making a proposal, which I'm then going to in part justify. Uh, so first of all, the first part of this proposal uh, is that there should be no exact global symmetries in quantum gravity. And this is not by any means my proposal. This is something that uh, comes out of the work from Hawking in the 70s uh, and was famously discussed by Banks and Cyberg and then a number of papers since then. So, uh, so this is one of the, these bits of standard lore in, in the swampland community. 
the other, uh, the, the more, uh, the newer and perhaps more controversial proposal I'm going to make is that not only exact global symmetries, but also approximate global symmetries should be uh, removed. In other words, symmetry should be badly broken within the context of effective field theory. And in particular, since effective field theory fails at the Planck scale, this means that global symmetry should be badly broken at or below the Planck scale. So why, uh, so let me try to justify this briefly. Um, I don't have a, a sharp argument against this, but I can give you a few heuristic arguments. Um, the first one uh, is that if you look at the uh, sort of the, the, the standard argument against global symmetries by now that was given famously in Banks and Cyberg and, and relates to Hawking's work from the 70s, uh, the issue with the global symmetry is that it leads to these problematic, stable Planck-sized black hole remnants. You, you have some uh, black holes, this whole family around the Planck scale uh, indexed by the representation of the group. And this seems to violate the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy formula. In the case at hand, if we have an approximate symmetry, we won't have exactly stable uh, black holes. However, we will have long-lived Planck-sized black hole resonances. And so the thought is that if exactly stables, stable black holes are giving us some issues with, with entropy bounds and with uh, expectations from the Bekenstein-Hawking entry, entropy formula, that having very long lived black hole states labeled by the different representations of the global symmetry group could ostensibly also give us trouble. Uh, this matches our intuition in simple examples I won't go over this today, but uh, uh, complex scalar field theory is an example, which is briefly discussed in our paper, where um, the, the symmetry breaking scales that we expect are uh, uh, agree with the definition that we've given so far. Uh, and finally, and this is what I wanna focus on today, is that this proposal seems to lead to agreement with weak gravity conjectures. So I'm gonna to focus today just on the ordinary weak gravity conjecture which deals with theories that have uh, a uh, just ele electromagnetism, a U1 gauge field, and uh, some charged particle. And the statement of the weak gravity conjecture is that uh, the charge to mass ratio of such a particle should be greater than or equal to one in Planck units. So now we can see- Christian, before, before you go yeah. on, so mm -hmm. I'm thinking about this notion of the approximate symmetry. From an EFT perspective, this, when I think of an approximate symmetry, I tend to think of a symmetry that maybe is preserved at the perturbative level, but broken by non-perturbative effects. Does this correlate to your definition with the correlation function, like how this delta behaves or? Um, good. So in, in that case, uh, you know, if you, if you have some say exponentially suppressed, um, uh, operators say that uh, they would break the symmetry, then those would lead to exponentially small corrections to the conservation law. Uh, and as a result, such symmetries would in fact be approximate. Um, you, you, would, you would have an approximate symmetry according to our definition. I would uh, say that this delta is much smaller than one. This right. threshold of delta equals one it's associated to the threshold between perturbative, non-perturbative in the sense of exponentially suppressed or not? It doesn't need to be next exponentially suppressed. Um, mm -hmm. For instance, uh, you may have, for instance, a, uh, a um, imagine uh, an approximate global symmetry that acts on a scalar field that could be broken by say Planck suppressed uh, higher dimensional mm -hmm. uh, operators. So, or so higher, you know, you have some higher derivative operators in, in your effective action. Those would lead to a, to power law um, mm -hmm. violation of the global symmetry. But at energy scales that are well below the Planck scale, where those higher dimensional operators are irrelevant and can be ignored, you still say that you have an, an approximate global symmetry. Okay, so the only thing is that it must be broken somehow below the Planck scale. So it's always there's some suppression in a sense. That's right. Uh, yeah. But can be polynomial or whatever. It doesn't matter how it's broken. Right. So for, for an ordinary global symmetry, this would be very much, this is akin to saying 
that uh, you'll have some Planck suppressed operators that come in and break the symmetry. So, um, so that's how it works for an ordinary symmetry, but, but now we'll see how it works for a one form symmetry and that'll okay. give us this relationship with the weak gravity conjecture. Yeah, yep, thanks. yep, thanks, good, good. Uh, yeah, thank you for uh, lots of good questions so far. So, um, okay, so there, there's sort of a quick way to see why the breaking of this one form symmetry might have something to do with the, uh, with the weak gravity conjecture here. So, uh, so suppose we have this action, we have, we have a charged particle coupled to this, uh, to, to um, Maxwell electromagnetism. And you recall that we have this electric one form symmetry whose current is given by star F. <clears throat> and the conservation of this uh, in the absence of this charged particle is just Maxwell's equation. So d star f is equal to zero. But now once we add in this particle, d star f is no longer equal to zero, it's equal to this uh, uh, term here, which depends on the fermion. So there's a couple of interesting limits to consider. One is the g goes to zero limit, in which case the dynamics of the gauge field and the fermion decouple. And essentially a one form global symmetry is restored as well as a, a zero form symmetry uh, more or less. So in the case of G goes to zero, we see that we expect that we'll get a, a, a symmetry restoration. And so we'll have a, a one form symmetry. Also in the limit where M goes to infinity, if it goes to infinity, this particle becomes very heavy, we can integrate it out. And so at low energies, we'll again find a one-form global symmetry. So the two limits here that will give us a one-form global symmetry uh, are the limit of G goes to zero or M goes to infinity. Uh, and these are precisely the limits that the gauge, sorry, the weak gravity conjecture forbids. Taking G goes to zero at fixed M or M goes to infinity at fixed G. In either case, the particle will no longer be super extremal and the weak gravity conjecture will be violated. So this is just a quick way to see why you would expect that the weak gravity conjecture is related to the breaking of this one form symmetry. Um, but we can, we can be a little bit more precise using the technology that we, int we introduced before. So we have this theory uh, in the limit as m goes to zero, or sorry, m goes to infinity or, or g goes to zero. Um, this is uh, what, what Hiroshi was mentioning earlier. Here we have these, these uh, two parameters so we can tune them as we wish and get a, uh, an exact symmetry. So here we'll have uh, this uh, parameter M, we have G, the gauge coupling. Uh, we can define the symmetry generator in the case of G uh, goes to zero or M goes to infinity. We also have these Wilson lines. And so to, compute the variation of the, uh, the uh, phase omega, or equivalently to compute the amount of breaking of the global symmetry, we consider this uh, correlation function involving U, the symmetry generator acting on the charged operator. And so here, since we're taking the, the, the limit of an infinitesimal symmetry transformation, we can expand this exponential and the, the relevant term, which measures the breaking of the word identity is going to be simply this correlation function of the Wilson line with uh, this integral of star F. Now this maybe looks a little bit intimidating, but it's helpful to think about what's going on physically here. So this Wilson line is more or less just a probe particle. So you can imagine some very heavy non-dynamical background charged particle, which travels through, uh, through time, we can just say that it's fixed their point in space. And we're going to surround this Wilson line with th this uh, operator, which essentially amounts to just this flux integral. So we're computing the integral of the electric flux or, uh, through a sphere, which encloses this heavy non-dynamical charged particle. And this is a situation that's very familiar to us. This is simply Gauss's law. So remember Gauss's law, from introductory physics classes tells us that the uh, electric flux through a surface is equal up to some constants to the charge enclosed by the surface, which also in turn could be written as this integral 
over the uh, the Coulomb potential from this charged particle. And so a, a point of, of reference here, you, you remember that the thing that, that's remarkable about Gauss's law when you learn it for the first time uh, is the fact that it doesn't matter what the size and the shape of this manifold is, right? All that matters as far as when we go, uh, as far as computing the electric flux is simply the charge that's enclosed. Here, we can say this in more fancy language that this is the statement that this operator here is topological, this, uh, this uh, flux operator. And so here we see that Gauss's law is actually just the statement that there's this one form symmetry in the absence of any dynamic dynamical particles in the theory. Once we introduce though, this, these dynamical particles, so once we add in the electron, the, the charged fermion, then this effective potential V will be modified. And so the effective charge will become uh, R dependent. It'll depend on the, the, the radius of this sphere that encloses the Wilson line. So this uh, unfortunately is no longer a uh, first year physics computation, but it is a textbook quantum field theory computation. So in particular, if you go look at Peskin and Schroeder, uh, pages 253 to 255, you get this nice explanation of computing the effective Coulomb potential in uh, QED plus, uh, so, so uh, U1 gauge theory plus a, an electron. And what happens here is that we have these 1PI loop contributions, which come from loops of the fermion, which correct the gauge propagator. And if you do a little bit of work, or if you, if you uh, see what Peskin and Schroeder do, you can massage this into an integral of this form. So here <clears throat> we have uh, two limits that are interesting to consider. One is where m times r is much larger than one. So in that case, this integral here uh, will start at e. Uh, we'll start at two m. So we'll have an e to the minus two m r, and this will lead to this exponential suppression. <clears throat> this right here is what's known as the Euling potential, uh, as, as discussed in Peskin and Schroeder. And physically what's happening here um, is that the, uh, from far away, there's this screening of the electric charge. And so the G that's showing up here is, is simply the normalized charge at infinity in the, in the deep infrared. And the Coulomb potential receives only these exponentially suppressed corrections. On, in the other limit though, where MR is order one or larger, then what happens instead is that uh, there's no longer this exponential suppression. And instead we have this logarithmic uh, piece here. So this log is the same log that shows up in the running of the electric charge. So what happens here uh, in the words of Peskin and Schroeder, is that as you go to energies, which are higher uh, distance scales of order one over M, you start to penetrate the polarization cloud and see the bare charge. And so this is nothing but the, the phenomenon of vacuum polarization. But the upshot for us is that we can compute using the, these formulas, the uh, effects on the Coulomb potential. And so we can see how the effective charge changes with distance R. So with this, we revisit our, our parameter delta, which is, uh, uh, let me re remind you, measures the change in the effective charge with distance scale R. And, uh, and in these two limits, you see that uh, delta will take this form. First of all, when R is much greater than M, we'll get this exponential suppression. When R is order M, or R naught, I should say, is order M or smaller, we no longer have this exponential suppression and the breaking effects are just of order n squared g squared, where here n, remember, is the charge of the fermion. Uh, a, a brief note on uh, Cumberland's question earlier, you'll note here that, that q, the charge of the Wilson line, has dropped out. So indeed, uh, our calculation is, is independent of q in this, in this case. OK, so what we wanted to say uh, is that our, our, our swampland proposal is that delta should be order one 
at the Planck scale. So if we plug in, uh, if we insist that delta is order one or larger at the Planck scale, then what this tells us, first of all, is that M needs to be smaller than M Planck because otherwise we have this exponential suppression. And uh, two, it tells us that N squared G squared should be order one or larger. So you put these together and the answer is that uh, the result is that n squared g squared over m squared has to be greater than one over m Planck squared. And this is the statement of the weak gravity conjecture. So the point here is that if the symmetry is broken by a, a single charged particle within the effective field theory, that this charged particle must satisfy the weak gravity conjecture. Can I ask now, this, a question? Sure. So I was wondering whether you can formulate your delta, this uh, uh, the measure of uh, amount of symmetry breaking. Uh, in terms of in the language of renormalization group, namely, suppose you uh, weakly gauge your global symmetry. Is it the case that your calculation is the calculation of beta function for the running of this weakly coupled? Of course, eventually you're going to turn off the coupling because you want global symmetry, but you can choose to gauge it if it is not anomalous. Right, yeah. Um, I don't know what happens if there is an anomaly. But... Right, right, right. Um, in this case, the answer is yes. Um, I think I think more generally um, that yes, that the um, that the change in the effective charge should be due to the running of some coupling constants. I think that's always true. So I think indeed that um, one well, that can, can that can connect this to more conventional language if you can do that. That yes, that's a that's a great point. Yes. Uh, I agree that so that would be I, a good thing. Can Thank I you. ask about the, uh, isn't it related to the beta function for the U1 gauge theory? It, it's not related to gauging, at least in an obvious way to me, to gauging the one form symmetry. Right, right. That, that's what I was thinking of. Is that what Hiroshi was talking I about? I thought Hiroshi was asking about gauging the global symmetry. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking of gauging a one form symmetry, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, that, that isn't so obvious to me. Um, oh, okay. But but yeah, but I mean yeah. What 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 Matt said is what I is what I thought you were saying is that I mean here the the running of the gauge coupling itself G is what measures uh -huh. is what is right. what tells you how the charge changes. So um so I think that that's a, a more general story. And so there definitely yeah there is a connection between okay. the beta functions and uh, for the coupling constants and these okay. variations. Yeah. So yeah, thank you. Yep, good point. And a naive question, what happened with the logarithmic correction here? It's in the gauge coupling. Or... Good, thank you. There, there's a log here. And uh, because we're ignoring order one factors throughout this talk, I said the, I'm setting the log to be order one. Yeah. And is this dimension dependent statement or is it any dimension? Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a closely related story um, in, in other dimensions as well. Um, so the, the same sort of calculation will work there, yes. But that's what I mean, in the weak gravity, there's a sharp, sharp number, which is the extreme of black hole uh, number. Is that, does that naively does not show up here, at least I don't see why it should show up here. You are doing a QED kind of calculation. So Thanks. black hole is not part of the story. So it's a bit uh, hard for me to see how that comes in. Thanks, yes, that's a really good point. And, and that's something that really should be, uh, that I should emphasize here which is that uh, this, this argument falls into the, the category of arguments uh, for the weak gravity conjecture, which are, are uh, more qualitative arguments. Um, in, in fact, in my, in my recent review article on this with, with Matt Reese, Ben Heidenreich, and, uh, and uh, Dan Harlow, we have a whole, we sort, of, we sort of split the arguments for the weak gravity conjecture into two categories. The ones like this that give a more qualitative um, version with these squiggles here, and then other arguments which have, have attempted to find exactly the weak gravity conjecture with the precise order one coefficient as shows up in the black hole extremity bound. Mm -hmm. I, I think right now, sort of the, 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 the state of the field is that we have a number of arguments like this that give this answer with a squiggle, uh, but there isn't really a sharp derivation of the weak gravity conjecture that gives the order one coefficients. So, so an inter interesting direction for future progress would be to try to, uh, if there's some, some way to sharpen this, to actually get the right order one coefficients here, that would be, uh, I think, quite quite remarkable and uh, 
a huge uh, step in uh, improving the weak gravity conjecture. But everything I'm saying today is going to have lots of squiggles. So this is, uh, is telling us something about the parametrics. But uh, I fully agree that there is uh, what we really like is to have a precise bound here with the order one numbers yeah. included. There's, there's a related question that I have related to the cutoff. Usually, we don't view alpine necessarily as the cutoff. There might be uh, bigger cutoffs that you have to first cross, which, uh, for example, the, black, the first black hole size might be bigger than alpine. Uh -huh. So I would have thought the naive thing should have been that part of, not the time. In which case, uh, that, that would introduce some kind of a light species kind of count, which might be related to the fact that the lowest number is not necessarily the status by the weak gravity. I don't know if that's something you studied or not. It's not something I studied. It's an, it's an interesting thought, um, but I, I don't, yeah, I, I don't have more to, more to say along those lines today. Okay. Yeah, thanks. So can I ask a question? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so here it seems that you're finding that the mass of the object must be smaller than M Planck. So you're um, saying that the, the breaking must appear in the in the effective field theory. But uh, one example that comes to my mind is that like when sometimes we have cores in classes that their um, triviality um, is is imposed by D brains, for example. For example, when you have P form, yeah. like, yeah. So in that case, these are non-perturbative objects of the theory, yeah. even though for them, there is also a disconnection between um, the gauge co coupling and, and the tension, but like, how would you um, uh, include them in this discussion? Because they seem to be like non-perturbative objects in the theory that break the global symmetry. Yes, that's a that's another good point. Uh, I'm, and I'm not sure how to, how, how one should include those in the discussion. I, I think to me, the, um, what, there, there is sort of this pre at present lacking um, explanation of why we should insist that these symmetries here are broken, um, broken in this fashion by within the effective field theory. I don't ha claim to have a great argument why that is. To me, the best argument is just simply that it seems to be giving us statements like the weak gravity conjecture that we already uh, that we already tend to believe are true. So to me, the, what, I'm, what I'm trying to do here is, is show this connection between the weak gravity conjecture and the, uh, the breaking of these approximate symmetries. I'm not claiming to give a great reason why these approximate symmetries should be broken in, the, in this particular fashion. So that's, uh, I think, a, an interesting direction for future work. Um, and you do bring up one, one of the, uh, a, good, a good illustration of where this logic seems to run into issues. Thanks. Yep. So, yep, a good a good caveat to point out. Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so, okay. So this this is uh, we talked about how this symmetry could be broken by a single charged particle. Um, this, however, is perhaps not such a realistic scenario because it, if this gauge coupling is very small, g is very small, then the way that this would be broken is by having a single very light very large charged particle with ng so that ng is order one. A more realistic scenario, what we actually tend to observe is that there would not just be a single light particle, but a whole tower of these light particles. In this case, the effective field theory breaks down at a scale which can be parametrically lower than the Planck scale, suppressed by a factor of square root of n, where n is the number of light species. In this case, we can again compute this parameter delta measuring the breaking of the symmetry uh, by, a, uh, by computing the, the one PI contributions to the uh, photon propagator. Here, we're going to have a sum over all the charged particles of the three whose, mass, who are, uh, whose masses are lighter than one over R0, where R0 is the, the radius of the sphere here. So we have this whole sum. And uh, we can write this, we can rewrite this in terms of the average charge squared of the particles whose masses are below one over R naught. If we insist that delta should be order one or larger at the quantum gravity scale, uh, lambda QG, then what this tells us is that in a sense, the average particle in this tower should satisfy the weak gravity conjecture because the masses of these particles are smaller than lambda QG. And what we see here is that the charge squared divided by the 
average mass squared is going to be greater than one over m pike squared. So in a sense, this whole tower of charged particles will on average satisfy the weak gravity conjecture, which is very similar to the tower weak gravity conjecture, demanding not just one, but a whole tower of super extremal charged particles. Uh, I also must mention that this uh, calculation is almost identical to one which appeared in a paper from 2017 by Ben Heidenreich, Matt Reese, and myself. Uh, there, we were looking at this in the, in the context of emergence. Uh, and here, a similar calculation shows up in the case of these approximate global symmetries. OK, so that was uh, one section of my talk. Now I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about weak gravity conjecture mixing in higher group symmetries. So first of all, what is a higher group symmetry? Well, the idea here is that you have some uh, a collection of p-form symmetries, and somehow these, these higher form symmetries get mixed up with one another. So to be more precise, let's suppose that we have a whole collection of n p sub k form u1 global symmetries. OK, so here p k could be different for different k. So maybe p1 is equal to 1, and p2 is equal to 0, or something like this. Uh, and we can couple each of these to a background pk plus one form gauge field. So this is the background gauge field associated with this global symmetry. What happens in a higher form symmetry then is that these the gauge transformations for these background gauge fields are mixed up with one another. So if you look at, say, a k, which is a pk plus one form, this can transform under a gauge transformation as a goes to a plus d lambda. So this is sort of the, the ordinary gauge transformation that we expect for a gauge field. But then there can also be this dependence on the other gauge parameters, not lambda pk, but lambda pi for i not equals to k. And so here, this alpha is a pk plus 1 minus pi form. Uh, which depends on the background gauge fields themselves. And then we also have these other gauge parameters. In addition, there can be these Schwinger terms, which involve products of two or more of these lambdas. And these terms here, the, this uh, modification of the gauge transformation is really the, the hallmark of one of these higher group symmetries. So here's an example. Uh, and this is the example that we'll be focused on uh, when we discuss the weak gravity conjecture. <clears throat> so here in this theory, we have two gauge fields. There's a, a one form gauge field A, so just ordinary electromagnetism. And then there's also a D minus four form gauge field, which has a D minus three form field strength. Uh, so C here, and G is equal to DC. Then in addition, we also imagine that we have this Chern-Simons coupling, uh, which in four dimensions would be like a theta FOHF coupling between an axion and the gauge field. But more generally, we have C uh, D minus four wedge F2 wedge F2. So this theory is going to have four higher form symmetries. You remember that when we have an ordinary gauge field, we have, uh, if, if you imagine that this term isn't there and this term isn't here, there's just going to be a, an electric one form global symmetry and a magnetic one form global symmetry whose charged operators are the Wilson lines and the Atuft lines, respectively. The same sort of thing happens here for this gauge field. We're now going to have some Wilson surface operators and some Atuft surface operators. And so a total of four symmetries, an electric one for F an electric one for G, a magnetic one for F, and a magnetic one for G. And we can then couple these four symmetries to background gauge fields. So uh, this is uh, quite a mess at first glance, but uh, let's, uh, let's uh, dissect this a little bit more carefully. We have the electric symmetry under which the Wilson lines of the gauge field A are charged. And so we can couple this two-form background gauge field 
like so here and here. Uh, similarly, we can couple this background electric gauge field for, for C here and here, uh, the lowercase indicating that this is uh, background, uppercase indicating that it's a gauge, uh, gauge, gauged symmetry. Uh, and then we, so then we also have the magnetic uh, higher form symmetries, which can be coupled like so. And then in the turn Simons term, we get these electric background gauge fields which show up. Okay, so the upshot of all of this uh, is that the electric gauge fields here are going to have ordinary background gauge transformations. So A goes to A plus D lambda, C goes to C plus D lambda. So the electric ones don't exhibit any sort of higher group structure. In contrast though, the magnetic background gauge fields have modified gauge transformations. So we have A goes to A plus D lambda, but then we also have these terms here, which depend on both the background gauge transformations as well as the background gauge fields themselves. So these are these, uh, excuse me, these terms here that we saw in the definition of a higher group symmetry. So here we see this mixing of these background gauge transformations into a higher group symmetry due to this turn Simons term. So you'll note that if K is equal to zero here, all of these terms go away and we, we would no longer have a higher group symmetry. So it's really the presence of this churn simons term with non-zero K, which gives us this modification. Now, because of these modified symmetry transformations, the, the gauge invariant field strengths must also be modified. We can't just have F equals DA because A here has these additional, this additional dependence, not only on lambda D minus three, but also on lambda one. And so to compensate, we need to add in this additional term here. And so the, the gauge invariant field strengths uh, take uh, this form for these magnetic symmetries. And the one I really wanna draw your attention to here is this latter one. Because this latter equation tells us that if we can turn on the background, if we turn on the background for A2, then this is generically going to immediately lead to a background for G4. And this is important because it means that any time that this symmetry exists, this is a, a valid symmetry of the theory, that this magnetic symmetry must also be a good symmetry of the theory. And this leads to a relation for the emergent scales of the electric 1-4 symmetry for A, with, which has A2 as its background field strength, and the magnetic D minus two form symmetry for C, uh, which has this as its background uh, field strength. So the relation is that this 1-form symmetry must emerge at a lower energy scale than the magnetic D minus two form symmetry. And this is pointed out uh, in a nice paper by Brennan and Cordova in 2020. So we're imagining here that we have this, these emergent symmetries so that at low energies, these are valid symmetries. And the point is that any time that this symmetry is, is a good symmetry of the theory, uh, the, the electric one from symmetry, this must also be a good symmetry. And so if this one has emerged at some energy scale then this one must have emerged at some higher energy scale. <clears throat> okay, so now what does this have to do with the weak gravity conjecture? Well, you remember uh, from what we just saw from consistency, the higher group structure that we need this to be less than this. This is the energy scale at which the electric one form symmetry for A emerges. This is the energy scale at which the magnetic one form symmetry for C, or sorry, high, uh, higher form symmetry for C emerges. Uh, which actually is a two form symmetry. So this one on the left here will be broken by charged particles. So if you have some charged particles, this is what we saw in the case of the weak gravity conjecture in part one of this talk, where you add in some charged particles at high energies, they break the global symmetry. That means that the, that the mass of the lightest charged particle has to be below this energy scale. 
On the other hand, as argued by Brennan and Cordova, this magnetic symmetry will be broken at an energy scale, which is no larger than the string scale for the string, which is charged magnetically under, uh, under C, which is given by the square root of the tension of this string. So what this is telling us is that the mass of the lightest charged particle in the theory must be, for consistency of the higher group structure, it must be smaller than the string scale of this magnetic string. And now this in turn is going to, to play an important role when it comes to the weak gravity conjectures. So what we're going to do here is in this theory, we're going to assume that the weak gravity conjecture is satisfied for the gauge field C. The objects which are charged here are instantons. In other words, they're, they're co-dimension four objects in the theory. And uh, so the tension of one of these instantons, which in four dimensions is simply the instanton action, has to be less than GT, GC times the Planck scale. The magnetic weak gravity conjecture for C, on the other hand, tells us that the string, the tension of the string, should be smaller than the inverse of this gauge coupling times the Planck scale. Finally, we can assume that the instanton action goes like one over GA squared. Uh, this is something which, uh, which uh, you may be familiar with, say in, in QCD, where the instanton action goes like one over G squared. Uh, in the abelian case, this relation still holds from considering monopole loops, uh, which was shown in a paper um, I should have referred to here by, by John Stout, Matt Reese, and collaborators uh, from a couple of years ago. And uh, so the upshot of these three equations here is that the string scale, the square root of the tension of this string, must be smaller than GA times the Planck scale. This, uh, this follows simply from combining these three inequalities. And that means that if we combine this, this equation here with the constraint from this previous uh, slide for consistency of the higher group structure, that the mass of the lightest charged particle has to be less than the square root of the tension, then this tells us that the mass of the lightest charged particle has to be smaller than the gauge coupling for A times the Planck scale. And this, once again, up to order one coefficients, is simply the statement of the weak gravity conjecture for A. So assuming the weak gravity conjecture for C, as well as the magnetic weak gravity conjecture for C, and this relationship here, with no assumptions about the weak gravity conjecture for A, just by consistency of the higher group structure, we learn that the weak gravity conjecture has to be satisfied for A as well. So I refer to this as weak gravity conjecture mixing, because here, the two different weak gravity conjectures for the gauge field C and for the gauge field A have been mixed up with one another. By assuming the weak gravity conjecture for C, we find the weak gravity conjecture for A follows immediately. And it's interesting to note, remember that the, the higher group structure that we saw mixed up the electric uh, symmetry, the electric higher form symmetry associated with A and the magnetic higher form symmetry associated with C. So it's interesting here that this bound also involves a mixing of the weak gravity conjectures, the electric one for A and the magnetic one for C. So what's happening in this weak gravity conjecture mixing is exactly paralleling the sort of mixing that we have with the background symmetries into the higher group structure. So uh, this is just generically going to be true then in, um, in lots of, uh, in, in generic dimensions. But let's talk about a, a couple of particular cases. So first of all, in four dimensions, uh, we have this action where now C becomes an axion theta. The, the gauge coupling is going to be the axion to K constant F sub theta. And here, the axion weak gravity conjecture tells us uh, that the decay constant times the instanton action should be smaller than M Planck. The weak gravity conjecture for strings gives us this bound on the tension of the charged axion strings. Uh, 
And so if we assume this form of the instanton action, then what we learn is that the string scale has to be smaller than GM Planck. Now, at this point, we could use the, uh, the argument from the higher group structure uh, from Brennan and Cordova. But one can also, also alternatively argue for uh, the weak gravity conjecture using anomaly inflow. Uh, this was done in, in my paper with Ben and Matt from 2021. So in, uh, in this theory, anomaly inflow on the world volume of the string uh, uh, would needs, uh, tells us essentially that the string excitations must carry electric charge in order to, to cancel this anomaly. And this means that the mass of a, a charge n string excitation is going to go like n times the string scale, uh, which from this bound here tells us uh, that the mass of a charge n uh, string excitation is going to be less than n times g times n Planck, which again is the weak gravity conjecture bound. So here, what are we learning? Not only is the weak gravity conjecture satisfied, but it's actually satisfied by the string excitations. So the weak gravity conjecture will be satisfied. And if we further assume that this axion is a fundamental, fundamental axion, i.e. that it's the, the core of the axion probes the deep ultraviolet, then we'll, we're going to have not only an ordinary uh, the ordinary weak gravity conjecture satisfied, but actually the tower weak gravity conjecture will be satisfied because there will be a whole infinite tower of these charged super extremal string states. Now, a noteworthy exception to this occurs when we have clues of Klein reduction of uh, five dimensional theory with this Chern Simons coupling. So uh, if we assume here that this is minimal supersymmetry in five dimensions, we compactify to four dimensions. What we're going to find is in four dimensions, we're going to have two different gauge fields. One, which comes from the, uh, the higher form gauge field, and the other, which is the Kluza-Klein gauge field. So here, uh, here B is actually a one form, and H is a two form. So this is the Kluza-Klein gauge field and its associated field strength. And you'll note that there is no theta h wedge h term. So this means that the, the whole argument that we just had uh, completely goes down the tubes because there's no higher group structure here involving h. Uh, there's no anomaly inflow argument. The string excitations don't necessarily carry charge and the instanton action isn't going to go like one over g squared. So, it's no longer the case that we are, we're going to say that the uh, charge string excitations will satisfy the weak gravity conjecture for the clues of Klein gauge field. However, there is a theta f wedge f term. So we can run the argument that we just saw for, for the gauge field f. We conclude that there are string excitations which will satisfy the weak gravity conjecture for f. And furthermore, using supersymmetry, the fact that we're, that we're assuming minimal supersymmetry here, we actually have a relationship between the gauge coupling for F, namely uh, E here, and the gauge coupling for, for the clues of Klein photon E K K. So the upshot of this is that the string scale will go like E times M Planck according to the anomaly inflow argument for this term. Uh, and then by this relation, it'll go like E K K to the one third M Planck. And this expression right here is, is an interesting one because this is nothing but the Planck scale in five dimensions. So what we're learning here is that the string scale, the, the, the scale at which effective field theory breaks down will be the Planck scale in five dimensions. And this is really what we expect for a clues of Klein compactification because ordinarily we'd say that, that effective field theory should break down at the Planck scale. But in a clues of Klein theory, the theory is secretly five dimensional. So we actually expect that effective field theory will break down at the five dimensional Planck scale. And so that's what we're finding here. Either, uh, so either if there is a theta F wedge F term, then we expect that the string scale will go like E M Planck, or in the absence of that term, we have that the, uh, that the um, effective field theory will break down at the five dimensional Planck scale. 
And this has some important ph phenomenological implications. I'm sorry to interrupt, sure. but we are running out of time. So if you can try to speed up, it would be nice. I will speed up. Okay. okay. Yeah, thank you. Sorry about that. Okay, so uh, yeah, I have like th three more slides. So uh, some quick phenomenological implications. Uh, the tower sublattice weak gravity conjecture imply a species bound scale that goes like this. In the presence of the theta FHF term though, we see that the strength scale goes rather than e to the one third in Planck, rather than like e, to the, uh, e times in Planck. So when E is small, this scale will be much smaller than this one, which means that effective field theory will break down into much smaller scale. And this leads to an incompatibility between theories that require a small coupling constant and theories which require a high energy scale. Okay, so the last thing I wanna mention before summarizing uh, is that there are analogs of this story in five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10 dimensions. So in five dimensional supergravity, from the cubic structure of the prepotential, you can show that there are two possibilities in the theory with two gauge, gauge fields. Either you have a turn simons coupling or you don't. In the case with the turn simons coupling, the string scale goes like GA, which is uh, what we expect. It says that the string excitations will satisfy the weak gravity conjecture. If there is no such coupling, the string excitations don't go like GA, they go like GA to the one fourth. And so what this is telling us is that uh, the structure of supergravity itself has encoded exactly what it needs to in order to satisfy the weak gravity conjecture consistent with the higher group structure in the presence of this turn simons coupling. And when there is no turn simons coupling, there is no such uh, structure. So supergravity essentially is made, it built in consistency with weak gravity conjecture mixing, anomaly inflow in this higher group structure. And this is true in, in D equals five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10 dimensions. In all cases, supergravity constraints alone give us these relations. Okay, so finally, let me uh, end with the main takeaways. So uh, first of all, we've introduced these higher form symmetries, which are symmetries which involve charged operators, uh, charged objects of dimension greater than zero. The weak gravity conjecture is closely related to the breaking of these higher form symmetries. We also saw that higher group symmetries are these symmetries in which two or more higher form symmetries are mixed up. And this leads to an analogous mixing up of weak gravity conjectures, which is mirrored and encoded in supergravity in higher dimensions. The main point here is that much of the swamp plane program can be understood in terms of the breaking of generalized global symmetries. Uh, I haven't even mentioned all of the work um, that uh, has gone, that has pointed to this. There are connections between the completeness hypothesis the breaking of non-invertible symmetries as well. It seems that these higher form symmetries are playing an important role, not only in quantum field theory, but also in understanding much of what's going on in quantum gravity as well. Uh, I'll end with some, some interesting questions to consider. First of all, we've seen that there's a big difference between theories that have theta FHF couplings and those that don't. When exactly are these required? The only example that I've seen so far where they don't where they aren't present is kaluza klein theory. So are there other examples? Uh, also, is there an analog of the convex hull condition for these higher group global symmetries? Uh, so this is the, these are the main questions. And, and finally, one I didn't mention, but which uh, Cameron brought up, can the order one coefficients here be, more, be made more precise so that we're getting exactly the weak gravity conjecture from these arguments? Okay, thank you and sorry for running over time.